Welcome to a new installment of Most Craved. I'm Ryan Turek from shocktillyoudrop.com. Now let's get right to it. The Marvel Cinematic Universe continues to grow as Josh Brolin has been cast in the role of the villain Thanos. Now you remember we saw the character at the end of the Avengers and we will be seeing him again in Guardians of the Galaxy this August. It is rumored that he will appear mostly as a hologram, but we'll see him in the flesh for one scene as well. Now over in horror news, Paramount has pushed back the next Friday the 13th movie by eight months. Ugh. Jason will hit the big screen again on November 13th, 2015, which is of course a Friday. Also, it sounds like Universal and Blumhouse are planning something big as they've secured three release dates for horror movies in September of 2015, January of 2016, and in October of that same year. Is a, horror, is a new horror trilogy on the way, perhaps? Maybe? And in a bit of a shocker, Warner Brothers has pushed back the Wachowskis' Jupiter Ascending to seven months to February 2015. Yikes. The studio says they need more time to complete this work on 2,000 special effect shots. That's a lot, and that's going to take a lot of work. Now, over at Warner Brothers in Netherrealm, they have announced Mortal Kombat 10, yeah, which will combine cinematics with gameplay for a new experience in 2015. And Batman fans are going to be crying because they will now have to wait until 2015 for Batman Arkham Knight. As Warner Brothers and Rocksteady coupled the bad news with a new Batmobile battle mode reveal trailer. Got that? For those who thought Star Wars Episode 7 casting announcements were over, Lucasfilm surprised fans with news that Oscar-winning actress Lupita Nyong'o and Game of Thrones star Gwendolyn Christie have joined the cast. And in other Star Wars news, Lucasfilm and Disney revealed Chronicle director Josh Trank will direct a standalone film that will offer a new story beyond the core saga. Now, let's join Silas and William to talk about Trank's involvement and to discuss the director who will be bringing Marvel's Doctor Strange to life, as well as this week's new sci-fi release, Edge of Tomorrow. So guys, Josh Trank, this news came out of nowhere this week. Uh, something I didn't expect because he's kind of busy doing Fantastic Four. Silas, what do you think about this? Uh, it's weird to have... He did Chronicle. He he was attached to Venom at one point. Yes, that's, um, right. that's right. He was attached to Shadow of the Colossus, which I'm still bummed will never get made. Now he's too busy. <laughs> that's the thing that these directors do is like once they come out of like a a film that does really well, that puts them on the map, and then I think there's this kind of like anxiety and concern at like, oh my God, what am I going to do next? Yeah. I just had a hit called Chronicle. You know, I could do Chronicle 2, let me land up a video game adaptation, well, you know, let me land up this. That doesn't go away. Steven Spielberg always has like seven or eight films in Guillermo. pre-production and development. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro. And the whole thing is, it's hard to get a movie made. It's hard to get the cast together at the right time. Yeah. So you just have as many pans in the fire as possible so that when one of them is hot, you can start cooking. And Good metaphor there. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Josh Trank is new. He's lining things up as fast as he can while well, Chronicle is still a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the Star Wars thing is going to get made. I'm pretty sure he's going to be all right. I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, it's just interesting how he got the gig because he's busy doing Fantastic Four so what is Lucasfilm Disney going on are they going based on the success of Chronicle and what he demonstrated there because it's kind of hard for me to think that a producer will look at Chronicle and go he can give us action scenes that's not found footage he can direct this that's not found footage Chronicle is a very character based film though. well that's what I'm saying yeah. I was gonna get to the character point of yeah it, but oh, you also sorry. need to no, no no but you need to demonstrate <laughs> whoa you need to demonstrate too that you can actually direct something and direct a scene with intensity and stuff like maybe that. maybe they saw that uh, Canadian miniseries he did was a kill point or something it was like a bank guy <laughs> maybe that's know. like really Star Wars yeah. oriented and or maybe they it. just saw stuff from Fantastic Four, or what? Yeah. Maybe like, or maybe he leaked other stuff to them. Or, but I just think it's really interesting that uh, yeah. you know he is the next director in line after Gareth Edwards uh, to do something. You know, just do like this one project that makes such a significant impact, and then boom, Star Wars gig. Well, I, so go I, make a movie, guys. I think Let's it spins. It, same thing happening with uh, with uh, Colin uh, Trevorrow and, and Jurassic World. Mm, yeah. we, we, there's an increased number of of bigger studios that are saying, "Let's get somebody uh, very artistic and smaller." that did something we like, and then give them that bigger yeah. play area. Well, I think Kevin Feige from Marvel Studios said his criterion for when he's looking for directors is they have to have done at least one great thing. Hmm. Other things, like, you know, th stuff happens, you know, a movie might fail for one reason or another, studio and fails, whatever, but if they can put out one great movie or one great TV show or something like that, that shows that they have it in them, and Josh Trank made one great movie. Yeah. And uh, you know who else made at least one great movie? Scott frickin' Derrickson. Yeah, but which Sunday. one? Which one is Kevin looking at? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was waiting for it. Which, which, what is Derrickson's one great movie that I Kevin would argue, probably looked at? I would argue that it's Sinister. 
Sinister, I consider one of the best horror films of the last 10 I'm years. With you. I, I think it's it. intelligent. I think it's wonderfully shot. Uh, I think it works a lot in the sort of metaphor that Marvel Studios looks for in their superhero movies. It's kind of simple power fantasies. Mm-hmm. That was more of an anxiety nightmare, yeah. but whatever. Uh, and, and he got a great leading performance out of Ethan Hawke, who incidentally wouldn't be a bad Doctor Strange. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, we're hearing rumors about Jared Leto, but whatever. They're rumors for now. Uh, this guy is a good director, The Day After Tomorrow, notwithstanding. Not Day After Tomorrow. What did he do? Day There Stood Still. Day There Stood Still. Jinx. Oh. Uh, I'll be quiet. I think he's a really good director, and I think this is a good choice. What, what do you think, Sal? Uh, Silas, what do you think? I, I'm excited. I think you're the perfect person to answer. How, how much do you think this means that Doctor Strange is going to be very horror oriented? <laughs> well, I think that like most people out there, I was never a Doctor Strange fan. I was. And I was not familiar with the comic book all that much. I mean, I reached for my usual titles, so Doctor Strange would often cross over into other titles that I would read, and I'd yeah. be like, oh, cool. But then when I would actually read something like a standalone comic, like Silver Surfer, I'd be like, meh. Um, but I'm really <laughs> excited about the prospects of, you know, the kind of uh, uh, otherworldly nature of it and what Derrickson can bring to the table. Uh, he's got another film coming out called uh, um, Deliver Us from, from Evil. Evil. Yeah. Uh, and I'm hearing some fantastic things about that. The trailer for that movie yeah. freaked me out with the, with the toy owl. Yeah. I, I was watching this with, oh, uh, with, my, with my podcast co-host, and we were just like, that owl's going to do something. <laughs> that owl's going to do No, the owl! Well, I think this will be Derrickson breaking outside of the box, but also reaching for you know, some of the staple genre tropes that he has created for himself within his you know, cinematic oeuvre. And he's been very classy about it in his other films, too. Yeah. They're not like... The, the, the day there's a till notwithstanding, he's not very visual effects driven. He's very much, and I think that's what Doctor Strange probably needs, is not to be too fanciful, maleficent, CGI, mm-hmm. fantasy characters flying around. I think it needs to be somewhat grounded to exist in the Marvel Universe, because this is the weird thing about Doctor Strange. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they have pretty much made clear that there is no magic, only science we don't understand. Mm. So incorporating magic now into it is an unusual choice, and it has the potential to expand the universe, and it also has the opportunity to make the universe more confusing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question I'm going to have to deal with. I've said before, I, w- I would love to see, uh, since he doesn't have a solo movie of his own yet, Bruce Banner. Have Bruce Banner go to <laughs> Stephen Strange and say, I need help he's, with my condition. He's had two solo movies. Well, not with Mark Ruffalo. Granted, <laughs> granted. I do think The Incredible Hulk is an underrated film, though. But you have it take place in, in the, the, the uh, mindscape of the Hulk. With, uh, you could have the Gray Hulk. You could have She-Hulk appear. Oh, jeez. Uh, well, we're going I, here now. I want She-Hulk. <laughs> I, think she, I think we're entitled to a She-Hulk movie. I think Marvel needs to get some female superheroes out there uh, beyond Black Widow. I do, I do think that's true. I just love the idea of a horror director moving into the superhero realm because it's worked so well before with Sam yeah. Raimi doing yes. Spider-Man. And we saw imprints of Sam Raimi's previous films from Evil Dead to Army of Darkness all over Spider- the Spider-Man trilogy. So yeah. that's what I'm excited about. I think, I think it's a really, 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 really good idea. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So over uh, your shoulder here, we got uh, Emily Blunt and Tom Cruise. Uh, we're going to talk about Edge of Tomorrow. I which... haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Science and I have. Uh, and I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, it, it should be opening in theaters today. So uh, if, if, if you saw it, share your own thoughts below. Uh, I, uh, I, I enjoyed it. Listen, man, I went in with no expectations. And I'm, <laughs> shh, quiet, I'm an Oblivion fan. I liked Oblivion. I don't know if that renders like my, my opinion moot, but moot! I really, I, I really liked Edge of Tomorrow. It surprised me. It's really clever. It's really smart. It's very like cynical and sarcastic, and it's got some really great gags. And I'm like, this is this is a classic Tom Cruise vehicle because it's not just him playing the hero. He is a coward. He takes a, a, a significant character arc. We see Tom Cruise start from the bottom, and then he becomes through the film, the Tom Cruise that we know and love. And that's what I liked about this. I will say, tiptoeing around spoilers, I love the movie. I, I thought the ending was really weak yeah, and I'm sort of so reeked so of a, a studio uh, switching it out at the last minute. Yeah. What um, did you think of the ending? <laughs> Let us know in the comments. Yeah, guys. we got to wrap this up. But I liked Edge of Tomorrow. I liked it with a couple reservations. And I'm going to speak for uh, William here and say he liked it too, I think. What the? No! Oh! <laughs> Come back next week, guys. We'll see you.